Right, is everybody ready to come off bypass? Yeah. Lungs are a bit stiff, but ventilating okay. Okay. Slowly come down on your flows. Soon after joining the Bristol Royal Infirmary as a consultant anaesthetist, Dr. Stephen Bolsin became concerned about how long some heart operations on children were taking, leading to a greater risk of complications. Oh, the heart's struggling. There's no ejection on the arterial trace. Now come back up to Hofflow. Uh, I'm going to have, to have another look at this patch. It may be obstructing the outflow into the left ventricle. I'm going to have to do this patch again. My concerns were related to the length of time these operations were taking. And we know that the longer you spend on bypass, then the more likely you are to have organ failure following cardiac surgery. And the time that the cross clamp is put on in cardiac surgical operations is the length of time the heart is deprived of oxygen. Now, the longer that time is, the more likely you are to have serious heart failure after the operation. And the longer it is, the more likely you are to die. Please. On some procedures, the failure rate at Bristol was three times the national average. The standard of Bristol's child heart surgery was to become the subject of the longest disciplinary hearings ever held by the General Medical Council. OK, airway's clear. Adrenaline, please, nurse. The hearings exposed a tragedy which has raised questions about doctors' accountability and sent shockwaves through the medical profession. No, no. This film examines the litany of management failures, from the hospital right up to the Department of Health, which allowed known problems to go unchecked for five years. At the centre of the Medical Council's inquiry were two senior surgeons, James Wishart and Janet and Dasmana, along with the chief executive of the hospital, Dr John Roylance. Back in 1988, James Wishart was a respected and influential figure in the hospital, but both he and Asmana were only part-time paediatric cardiac surgeons. The rest of the time, they performed adult cardiac surgery. It can now be revealed that their peers were aware of problems at Bristol early on. In 1989, a committee, uh, and I was a member of that committee, reported to the Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons uh, when we were reviewing the provision of care uh, for baby cardiac surgery for the country. Uh, and at the time there were nine units and maybe six would have been enough. So there were reasons to identify those who were not performing uh, as well. And uh, Bristol was one of the two or three in the bottom of that ranking at that time. Now, what was done with the information? I'm not sure, but of course, uh, Bristol would have known that and their response presumably was to keep trying to do better uh, rather than uh, to accept that they should stop doing paediatric cardiac surgery. The layout at Bristol was also far from ideal. Children had to be treated on two sites. They were seen by cardiologists at the children's hospital, then referred down the hill to the infirmary for operations. As he became uneasy about the results of the operations, Dr. Bolson began to keep detailed records. I wasn't initially at all critical of what was happening in the unit. It was only as the picture emerged that these were fairly routine operations that were not getting the routine outcomes that they should have done that my concerns were really aroused. Two operations were at the centre of the medical hearings. One was the AV canal procedure, which repaired holes in the heart. The other was the switch, which corrected a defect where babies were born with their arteries the wrong way round. AV canals were done by both Janadan Dasmana and James Wishart, whereas the switches were only done by Dasmana. Bolson's anxieties grew when he read the hospital's application for trust status, which he felt glossed over the problems. He wrote to the chief executive to be Dr. John Roylance, ending his letter by pointing out the mortality rate for open heart surgery on infants under one year. This, as you may or may not know, is one of the highest in the country, and the problem should be addressed. There's a phone call for you. Okay. Bolsin got a response, but not the one he'd wanted. His letter seems to have been treated by Dr. Roylands as part of internal hospital politics. Hello, Bolson. I've received your letter, and I can tell you that the matters you've raised 
are not relevant to our application for trust status. Right. Thank you. Bolton repeatedly faced a problem. The person he was complaining about was the same person he was expected to complain to. James Wishart held a succession of senior posts in the hospital, and he now summoned Bolson to see him. Mr Wishart was very cross. He used clipped and terse phrases to describe uh, what I had done as being not good for my career in Bristol. This is not the way I was to proceed. I was left in no doubt that my career in Bristol was in jeopardy if I carried on in this way. It's one of the reasons that I never took results back to him again. Bolson did eventually raise some of his concerns at one of the ad hoc meetings of the cardiac team. Well, I, I think that my figures show that the problem's not as serious as some people on the unit might have thought. Well, all I can say is that I've seen Chris Lincoln at the Brompton do these procedures. Our outcomes are a lot worse. We're taking a lot longer. Our cross-clamp times are a lot longer. This could be the reason why we're seeing the problems here. There have been improvements recently in our operative and post-operative management of these patients. And I feel sure that we will emerge overall as one of the finest centres in the country for paediatric cardiac surgery. But Mr Dasmana was dogged by problems that were later to be described as his learning curve. Having started the switch operations in 1988, seven of his 14 child patients had died by January 92, 50%. The Medical Council heard that anything approaching 20% should have given cause for concern. Steve Bolton eventually began to collect data to try and prove his belief that babies were dying unnecessarily. He was helped by Dr Andy Black, who was also a statistician. Ah, I've got another AV canal. Uh, what's the extubation time? I'm looking for that. Well, it's been in intensive care for two weeks anyway. They produced a report which showed that in some procedures Bristol's performance compared badly with the national average. Mr Wishart's results with the AV canal operation appeared particularly poor. Um. Bolson took his report to the clinical director of cardiac services. The unit has a problem that I think you should know about. Yes? Yes, um, Andy Black and I have done an audit of some of the procedures in paediatric open heart surgery. The results aren't very good, I'm afraid. Mm. Yeah. Um, if I can just show you, um, over here we have the results from the National Cardiac Register and in this column are ours. As you can see, our mortality on the AV canal isn't very good. We've also looked at cross-clamp times, extubation times and the length of stay in ITU. Um, they don't compare very well, I'm afraid. Well, they're interesting figures, Steve, but I have yet to be convinced these VSD figures, for instance, that's a very surprising result. I wouldn't have thought there'd be a problem with VSDs these days. Bolson later discovered that he had made a mistake with one procedure, the VSD. Overall, however, the medical hearings vindicated his report. Gentlemen. He took his results to other colleagues, including John Fondon, Professor of Surgery. Professor Fondon told Bolson that he needed to obtain data that was agreed by all the doctors involved. He later said to the hearings that he did not recall passing on Bolson's concerns to anyone in authority. Ah, uh, James, how nice to see you. Anything in particular, or is this a social call? Well, I am a bit concerned. I understand there are some figures doing the rounds about paediatric cardiac surgery. Steve Bolson's been collecting data, I believe. Yes, he did come in here with some figures. Well, I've come in to set the record straight. I've pulled out some figures of my own. Now, if you look at this figure over here, it does look unsatisfactory. But look at these operations over this time frame, and you can see that the mortality is actually extremely low. Mm. Yes. It is now clear that no systematic audit of results was taking place in the paediatric cardiac unit. There were meetings of consultants, some held in the homes of senior members, where various problems were discussed, but these were far from ideal. It wasn't an easy forum to be critical either personally or corporately of what was going on. It's very difficult to criticise somebody when you're sitting in their, in their lounge, drinking their wine and eating their biscuits. In 1992, there was an attempt by a cardiologist, Dr Rob Martin, to establish regular audit meetings. But when Private Eye ran a series of articles containing leaked data about the hospital, the meetings were stopped. 
the hearings were told that the consultants feared further leaks if they continued. It was also revealed that the cardiac surgeons had failed to submit any returns to the Hospital Audit Committee in 1992 and 93. This coincided with a run of failures for Mr. Wishart. By the end of 93, seven of the 13 AV canal operations he had performed since 1990 had ended in death, a mortality rate of 54%. The hearings were told that the average mortality for this operation was probably 20%. We recognize that surgeons need to have a high level of determination. Uh, and when determination becomes stubbornness and doggedness, of course, it's a gray zone. Uh, personally, and I know speaking also for some of my colleagues, we know we could not have continued knowing uh, what is available elsewhere in the country and that those patients could have gone elsewhere with that level of mortality. By this time, Dr. Bolsin had gained a powerful ally in Gianni Angelini, a colourful Italian who had arrived at Bristol as Professor of Cardiac Surgery. Having seen Bolsin's report, Angelini says that he tried on a number of occasions to discuss the problems with Mr. Wishart. The relations with Mr. Wishart were very cordial, certainly more from his side than mine, because I would be pretty straight to the point. I, I wouldn't beat much around the bush. I would just say, I don't like this result, these results are bad. And he wouldn't budge. He was just trying to convince me that I was in the wrong. Professor Angelini eventually took the matter up with the hospital's chief executive, Dr. Roylands. These figures show we have a serious problem in this hospital. <laughs> Look, Gianni, if there is a problem, it's a clinical problem. So it's a problem for the clinicians to sort out. But it is the surgeons who are the problem. How can they sort it out? Well, these judgments really do have to be made within the field of competent clinicians. I'm outside that field, and so, with due respect, are you. I mean, just think about it. I'm in charge of nine hospitals. They all have a great many specialities. It would be wrong for me to tell the experts what to do. Relations between surgeons and some of the anaesthetists were now highly tense. Yet despite numerous opportunities, the problems were not openly discussed. I think we have a situation in which the surgeons doing the operations were not really as good as were available elsewhere in the country. They'd also got into a practice of working in a provincial city where they, I think, slightly drew up the drawbridge. And gradually the team gets cohesive to defend itself against what is perceived for a long time to be unjust outside criticism. Dr. Bolsin would eventually raise some of his concerns with a Bristol MP, Dawn Primarolo. She later tried to get a response from the Department of Health. I raised a detailed number of questions. I consider the responses, particularly from the Department of Health and Dr. Roylands, to be inadequate. Following evidence that survival rates were higher on babies or neonates than on older children, Mr. Dasmana had begun doing the switch operation on infants in January 92. The first five he performed on all died. After five further deaths in 93, he decided to stop operating on babies under one month old. Mr. Dasmana was apparently concerned by his failures and twice consulted with an expert in Birmingham. But by the start of 94, 17 of the 34 children that he'd operated on had died. A death on the table isn't just a simple statistic. It's three theatre nurses in floods of tears trying to dignify the death of a small child in a high-tech operating theatre by gently washing the body with soap and water. This child's got a huge scar in its chest. It's still got drips and tubes in it. And they're trying to dignify this macabre scene. Death on the table doesn't convey any of that emotion, but that's what was happening consistently and unnecessarily in the unit in Bristol. Six anaesthetists signed a letter to their director, Chris Monk, asking for a review of the switch program, in the expectation that he would take it up with the surgeons. Yeah, okay. This responsible approach to what is obviously an unacceptable clinical practice I think we'd prefer this responsible approach to our clinical practice. 
It is not clear what happened to this letter, but it did not stop the operations. During 1994, Mr. Wishart did two more AV canal operations. Both children died, bringing his mortality rate to 60%. He finally stopped doing this operation. Dr. Bolson, by this time, had been asked to join the Department of Health's National Cardiac Audit Committee. This put him into contact with a senior medical officer outside the hospital, Dr. Peter Doyle. Bolson told Doyle about his concerns and suggested he talk to Professor Angelini. Doyle wrote a carefully composed letter to Angelini, expressing anxiety at what he'd heard. I further understand that some sort of audit has been carried out which confirms a greater than expected mortality rate for certain procedures. I trust steps are being taken to remedy any problems that have been identified. Professor Angelini says that he showed this letter to Professors Fanden, Van Jones and Dr. Roylands. The response was a reply detailing the hospital's plans for improving the situation in the future. Earlier that summer, Mr. Dasmana had performed two switch operations on older children. Both died. After a meeting of the cardiac unit, tempers now became frayed. I want a word with you, Jeremy. Sure. I hear that you're going around outside of Bristol talking about my results, discussing them with other surgeons. Oh, I don't know what you mean, going around. Of course, I have to seek advice if I can't get any sense out of the people concerned. Well, I take strong exception to you discussing this outside the hospital. Why didn't you talk to me? You already know what I think. And so you go and talk to everyone else? I have talked to the Department of Health. Department of Health? You have involved the Department of Health? They approach me with their concerns, not the other way around. You complain about me talking about you, but you should be grateful. I have been saying your work is good, except the switch. You must have a critical attitude when you made a mistake, to why you made that mistake, how can you improve it? If that mistakes happen once every so often, you can justify to your peers and to yourself, because we are human, we are fallible. But if those mistakes become routine, then I don't think you can justify them to yourself. You know, James... By the end of 94, Professor Angelini had become concerned about another aspect of Bristol's heart surgery. He raised it at an evening meeting at Mr. Wishart's home. Well, what I wanted to say was, I think we have a problem with the adult figures as well, and we should be looking at these cases too. Well, I'm sure there are any worries. They will emerge in the usual course of our audit meetings. What, in the same way as the paediatric cases? Another mess like that? Professor Angelini approached Professor Fanden again, which prompted Fanden to have a meeting with Mr. Wishart. His note of that meeting reveals the level of anxiety that had already reached him from colleagues, including anaesthetist Chris Monk. However, he wrote, I don't want anything done until I have had an opportunity to come alongside as a friend and colleague. Tacit agreement that paediatric figures are not good. Says that he has not been approached by anyone directly over doubts over performance figures. The two men apparently agreed the definitive data of surgery results should be produced and then discussed and approved by everyone in the cardiac unit. I would suggest that this exercise should be completed before Christmas, if at all possible. It wasn't. The meeting never took place. Hello. Six months earlier, one-year-old Joshua Loveday had been referred to Mr. Tasmana, who had recommended that he have the switch procedure in the next few months. The operation was eventually scheduled for January the 12th. They're going to do another switch. With Tasmana? When? On the 12th. And Pawade doesn't arrive until May. <sighs> Why don't they send the child to Birmingham? You know, we've got to do something about this. Bolson approached Sheila Willits, a consultant anaesthetist. Have you heard? We're doing another switch. I mean, I don't know what we should do about it, but I think we should do something. I agree. I'll talk to Van Jones at once. Great. Did you know this? There is another switch scheduled. This is crazy. Now, hold on a minute, Jeremy. We are not good at this operation. We should not do this operation. Everybody knows that by now. Look, as I've told you before, this is something for the medics to sort out. It's not for me to decide on clinical matters. As I understand it, the discussions are going on in the department about this switch program, so the matter is being addressed. 
Now, as you know, we'll have the new paediatric cardiac surgeon here soon. You should feel reassured with that. And the plans to go to the children's hospital. John, can I have a word? Did you know there's another switch planned? No. Yes, for the 12th. I really think it's most unwise under the circumstances. Don't you think we should exercise our option to send him to Birmingham? He's had previous surgery, so it's an increased risk. And with all the tension around in the hospital at the moment, it would be a very bad time to do it. Well, I think we ought to see what the cardiologist says. Who is it? It's Rod Martin, I believe. I'll give him a call. James, this switch on Thursday, you should stop this operation. I'm coming to you as medical director now. Oh, the child needs the operation. We've taken all factors into account. It can't be that urgent. This is an elective case. It's been waiting for months. The child is not a neonate. We have discussed these outcomes, and they indicate that we have no problems with non-neonates. Sheila Willits also called Mr. Wishart. It's Sheila. Look, I'm sorry to come to you like this, but I really am very concerned. There's an increased risk with this child wherever the operation is performed, and given the situation here, I think it's very unwise to go ahead. Yep, I don't see why. Why can't we send him to Birmingham? That arrangement's been in place for some time. She spent nearly an hour on the phone, but failed to get the operation postponed. Steve Bolson contacted Dr. Doyle at the Department of Health. Ah, Peter, they're going to do another switch. Yeah. Dr. Doyle rang Dr. Roylands. Ah, hello, Peter. And warned him of the risks of proceeding with the operation. Roylands told him that he would abide by the decision of the medical director. Because of the mounting criticism, James Wishart, as medical director, had called an unprecedented 11th hour meeting of the cardiac surgical teams to decide whether the operation should go ahead the following day. Well, as you see, of the 13 neonates operated upon, nine died. Consequently, we stopped the neonate program last year. In respect of the non-neonates, 24 patients have been operated on since 1988, and there were eight hospital deaths, but five of those were in the first two years. Since then, there have been three deaths out of 15. Well, I think we're all in agreement as to what the correct figures are. What we have to decide now is whether it's appropriate to perform this procedure with this patient. I think this particular set of figures are okay if you're dividing the cases between non-neonates and neonates. This is an institutional problem. It is not possible to be confident that we can do this operation. But you've seen the figures for non-neonates, and this patient is well over one year. You agree that the figures are acceptable. Well, if you put it that way, I can't argue. But there is another factor. The Department of Health are aware of this. Think about the consequences for the hospital if something goes wrong tomorrow. Have you been talking to the Department of Health? I frequently speak to the Department of Health regarding my audit activities. You know what I mean. Have you been talking to them about this? Have you taken this outside the hospital? Well, Peter Doyle knows about it, yes. So what exactly is your connection with the Department of Health? Well, I thought it was quite well known that I've been appointed to conduct a national audit of adult cardiac surgery. Well, that's, uh... The meeting found no reason to stop the operation. Only Steve Bolson disagreed. Afterwards, Mr. Wishart took Mr. Dasmana and Dr. Martin aside. We've got a loose cannon here. Would it be politic to postpone the operation? Well, Joshua's getting blue. It couldn't be postponed for long. He's been waiting for six months. I don't think we should be influenced by politics. Well, the prognosis will get worse if we wait. In years of peer ban, it will make the sinuses worse as time goes on. But are you still happy to do it, Janard? The meeting was rather unpleasant. You don't think the stress might affect you? Well, no, I, no, I, I don't think so. I can do it. While the arguments raged about her son's operation, Amanda Evans was tucking him into bed at the hospital. She and her partner then left to spend the night in the flat that the hospital kept for parents. But at 11 o'clock, they were asked to come back by Mr. Dasmana. He did not mention the meeting he'd just come from. Instead, he went through the operation that Joshua was to have and asked them to sign a consent form. Have you seen Joshua? Yes. Yes. Was he okay? Yes, he's fine. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't come past. 
happens to you. After 12 hours in the operating theater, Joshua died. The hearings were told that during the operation, Joshua's main coronary artery was damaged, but that this could have happened in the best of hands. After Joshua's death, Mr. Dasmana stopped doing the switch operation. Tensions in the hospital reached a peak. At last, the management called in a highly regarded surgeon from Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, Marc de Laval, to investigate its pediatric cardiac surgery. But his initial report was mysteriously amended within the hospital. An earlier reference to Mr. Wishart's individual performance in the AV canal operation was removed. Concern now grew outside the hospital about the standard of adult cardiac surgery as well. An independent review headed by Professor Tom Treasure found that Mr. Wishart's performance was significantly poorer than that of his colleagues. The review recommended that Mr. Wishart should not resume operating. But Professor Treasure found Mr. Wishart unwilling to accept the report. How it could be so clear to me and not evident to James Wishart, I cannot explain. But it did illustrate to me the sort of thing that must have been happening over the years. That things that seemed fairly clear-cut and merited attention could be explained away or seen in a different way. Uh, and he was in some way able to protect himself from what to me seemed to be the stark truth. You murdering bastard! James Wishart and John Roylance were finally struck off by the medical council. Mr. Dasmana was banned from operating on children for three years. All were found guilty of ignoring the concerns of their colleagues. The system fails systematically at every level, and this is hospital management, senior people within the hospital who failed to recognize the presence of the problem, the region who knew about the problem, perhaps the college as well who knew about the problem, and ultimately the Department of Health. So, the surgeon may not have self-assessed himself, but the ultimate failure was that the organ which are responsible to check on the system, and the ultimate organ, in my view, is the Department of Health, which failed miserably in this. The tragedy at Bristol has cast doubt on the fitness of the medical profession to regulate itself. Many believe that the forthcoming public inquiry into events at Bristol will reveal further failures among the staff and a far greater number of victims than the 29 investigated by the Medical Council.